Greg Provost in the River of Fate. Do you believe in fate? I do, but it depends on which timeline and universe you're operating in. I am not, however, parachuting into writing about multiverses or specific parallel universes in this post. I wish to get slightly creepier, focused on one predetermined timeline and people caught up within the whole scenario. Yeah, 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 yeah. Before you leave, the Calvinists were religious Protestants in the 1500s. John Calvin went into great detail, specifically defining the interpretation of the Word of God. I'm focused on predestination. So if you're a rat, then leave the ship now. God has predestined your wolves himself. You're a sinner and you're out of the club. If God chooses you, you're in. You lucky dog, it's unconditional. I must have been a Calvinist in another life when I wrote The River of Fate because what happens to Greg Provost is fixed in concrete. The goddesses determine human destiny, the breadth of a person's life, his quota of misery and suffering. Joseph Campbell said, the fates will lead him who will, him who won't, they will drag. In anniversary of sorts, Caroline and a young woman and her husband Greg. With a little too much hard liquor, Greg begins a long ramble of his early life in Reedsville, Pennsylvania. Caroline is shocked as Greg reveals new revelations about an accident that occurred at a basketball game at Paul Revere High School in Reedsville. Although Greg is a successful realtor, he's downtrodden that he hadn't achieved his basketball goals as a youth in Pennsylvania. Caroline reminds Greg they are heading for Chicago in a Christmas symphony concert. On the way out of the Hearthside restaurant, Greg notices the mausoleum-faced gypsy revealing the fate of individual restaurant patrons. But the gypsy spots Greg and something within her tells her that the river of faith is not flowing safely for Greg Provost. From within, she summons a warning that Greg will not heed. The gypsy warns him not to go into town because it will cost him his life. Although Greg dismisses the gypsy's prediction, Caroline is shaken. They enter the symphony hall and the pomp and circumstance of Handel's Messiah. The threat of death instigated by the gypsy dissipates into the winter night as Greg and Caroline enjoy the festive season. Greg isn't sure, but he'll insist that he just saw Marco St. Germain from his high school class back in Pennsylvania. In the cold air, they move slowly toward the crowd in the direction of the CTA subway line. Out of the crowd comes an evil that dwells within the middle-aged man with receding black hair. He grasps the gun tightly and buries the muzzle in Greg's body, sending Greg in a bloody mess to the pavement. He dies in Caroline's arms. You can't just walk back a terrible break or the cold finality of death. Moving forward, Caroline requires grieving and rearranging her life without Greg. Any change in life requires adjustment and a sense for the future. Caroline has a sense for the past. For weeks, she visits Greg's grave, clutching his yearbook from Reedsville, Pennsylvania. She marvels at the young and slender Greg and his basketball prowess at Paul Revere High School. That was years ago in another part of the country. Greg's basketball career was squelched on a winter afternoon. If only she could change the past. Diverting loss is often accompanied by time away, and that's just what Caroline and her uncle are going to do. Flying away from Chicago six months after Greg's death would allow her to rest. Caroline is to meet her uncle at the airport, but she's running late and about to face a violent thunderstorm. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, there's much more going on here. One of the Twilight Zones that really rattled my cage starred Inger Stevens. Stevens was driving across country and repeatedly encountered a hitchhiker she had seen first at a gas station dozens of miles back. The episode is appropriately called The Hitchhiker, and it was first broadcast by CBS on January 22, 1960. The hitchhiker is mysterious. We don't know who he is or what his intent on this Stevens could be. Yet he has a mantra that has ramifications beyond a few uttered words. So damn simple with huge deadly implications. Serling wrote the teleplay based on Lucille Fletcher's radio play. If you've read up to this point, you know it's going to be popping up like a duck in a carnival arcade. 
Add the loud threatening storm to that trip to the airport and even the strong-willed Caroline is afraid. Again and again, Caroline crosses an old iron bridge in the pouring rain and thinks she will be safe over the next hill. I asked the hitchhiker in the Twilight Zone if Caroline would be safe. He merely laughed and stuck out his thumb and said, Going my way? On the bridge, not only does that old gypsy seem omnipotent in the deadly storm, but she's able to surreptitiously enter Caroline's car. The door is locked shut. Then the handles fall off the side door panels. Hey, she just wants to make a deal. That's simple, too. She can bring Caroline back to change the river of fate. After what seems like hours, the gypsy vanishes and Caroline continues to the airport in the thunder and lightning. Caroline races toward the airport and Bailey joins her uncle before the jet takes off. Why was the gypsy on the opposite escalator? Caroline is sure she has missed her flight. Somehow the gypsy has become more and more involved. Somehow the gypsy has become more involved with the flights. Her uncle reveals that the gypsy has spoken to him on the flight. They'll have to redefine Greg's death. As the plane starts on its course, a wild transformation occurs hours later. They are not in 1993, but in 1968. Yes, the story evolves to Reedsville, Pennsylvania in 1968. The evil in the form of Marco St. Germain awaits them in the small town. So does the youthful Greg Provost. The large department store in Reedsville is based on my own experience in a department store as well as snippets of the plot. The large department store in Reedsville, Binghamton's, is based on my own experience as are snippets of the plot. The evil Marco is the driving force of the book and the obstacle to Caroline preventing Greg's life-changing accident. This novel had nothing to do with Peggy Sue Got Married. I know of the movie but never saw it. Rather, I was more influenced by Harlan Ellison in the Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever in this way. The main characters interact back in time to resolve an inexplicable variance in time. Let's get into the weeds. Only a few lines from Ellison remain in the final product. That must have gone over really well with Harland. Stephen W. Karabatsos wrote a draft from Ellison's original, not used. Gene Kuhn got involved, didn't work. So they get Ellison back. Nope, that wouldn't fly. It was Dottie Fontana's version, tweaked by Roddenberry, that made it to America's TV sets on April 6, 1967. And Fontana literally never got credit for the effort, but she gets it here. Seeing time evolved in some past epic, as Kirk said, looking at the Guardian and the city on the edge of forever, strangely compelling, isn't it, to step through there and lose oneself in another world. Just watch the first Back to the Future movie with Marty marveling about what's going on in 1955. There's an inane security about being back in the past. Be forewarned one that that security is like a defense mechanism, seemingly to be the all and end all. What's left, as for Caroline and Greg, is dealing with those evil forces swirling around the river of fate. Okay, I have to give a taste of the epitome of the dark side. Everybody's punk. Marco St. Germain. And yes, 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 City on the Edge of Forever is my favorite Star Trek episode ever. RPF.